the Lord has put things in the earth to teach us about him. Water. Water takes different forms. Water can be a liquid, it can be a solid in the form of ice, and it can be gas. Three separate distinct forms, yet all water. And he says, I'm using this to teach you about me. I'm the father of creation. I'm the son of redemption. And I'm the Holy Ghost in keeping you in the earth. But I'm God. Not three separate gods. Not God the father. God the... I'm just water. I'm God. I'm the spirit. I move. Anything with more than one head is a freak, including God. James chapter 2 verse 19 James chapter 2 verse 19 you believe there is one God you do well <laughs> the devils believe also and they tremble you can't believe there's one God and not do something about it even the devil does something about it whoa May God grant me to act like that when I'm 74. Wow. He's, you know, he's like fine wine. The sack gets a little wrinkled, but the juice still got a kick. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. And I am serious. I preach for a living. And, uh, and I would be very happy and consented right now just to go home. I don't need, I've heard myself preach. It, it, if he got any better than he just did, he had to be two people. You start making me believe in reincarnation. Wow, that was wonderful. Appreciate meeting all you wonderful leaders. And God bless you. Honor to be with all of you. Praise God. <laughs> quarter to 11, that means it's qu quarter to 8. Quarter to 8. Let's well, all synchronize. Quarter to 8 means absolutely nothing. <laughs> And, and I do want to tell you, Bishop, because I'm not going to be as long as it was last night, but you, you trampled all over everything I was going to try to say tonight. So it makes me, makes me feel like at least one of us is on the right page. And I think it's you. Reading uh, uh, two portions of Scripture, 2 Kings chapter 7, and I don't know whether people can go ballistic twice in one service. I have no idea. But I, I promise you, I'm not going to try to speak for your response. And if you don't want to respond, you lose. Because see, to me, the potentate's on the prowl. He's on the prowl. And, and he's looking to find somebody who prays and worship him. And, and if you sit there like a bump on the log, I got to get away from you because God ain't going to step over you to get to me. Now, where, where's all my sweet black folks again? Hope I didn't offend anybody last night, but the wonderful black folks that go to our church, I, one thing I always like about them, they're very reverent and very respectful for the pulpit. And when they have to go out for any reason, that if, you, if you watch black folk, they put their finger up. That, that's a polite way of saying, excuse me, I, I got to go get a drink of water or whatever I got to, excuse me. And I tell our church back home, now, if I start to preach or the choir starts to sing and you're sitting to an idiot, put your finger up, excuse me. I don't need to wait for your resurrection. I'm already resurrected. 
Amen. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 7, beginning please with verse 3. I know this is a scripture that many people preach on and use, but I don't want you to disallow it, please. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine's in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians, if they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And just this next verse, and they rose up in the twilight. That's all I want. And they rose up in the twilight. Now I'm going to the book of Mark. Mark, my God, I got so many notes here, I could preach three years. Wow. Mark chapter 4, verse 15. I mean, verse 35, excuse me. And the same day when even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. I'd like to ask you California theologians, are you going to answer me after the service? Where did he get the pillow? And it always bothers me to go fishing and I bring bait and somebody brings a book. That makes me nervous. I'm trying to upset the balance of nature and they're reading. Now watch. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? that even the wind and the seas obey him. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes. I'm just going to kind of tag on to the bishop's message, okay? I, w I want to talk to you for something because I probably won't pass this way no time for a long time. Listen carefully. It's time to let your problem push you into your answer. Yeah, that, that was too wussified. Let me try it again. Okay, that was too, too low for you. I'll go a little deeper. It's time to let your crisis become a catalyst to change. No. Okay, I'll go over here. It's time to let your disaster drive you into your deliverance. <laughs> Lord, bless the preaching. Help me to be a blessing to these sweet and wonderful people. Let the Holy Ghost work. I pray, Lord, that you would allow the operation of the gifts of the Spirit tonight, that somehow we could get a whole bunch of folks healed and a whole bunch of folks delivered and helped and set free. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm not in a hurry. I made a, I made a statement last night that to me went over like a lead balloon. And so I'd like to try it again and see if I can help you. Last night, for a few moments, you let me show you and prove to you that your adversary is afraid of you. Okay? Now, I, I pray that you grab a hold of that. But what I made a statement last night is the power of perception. Let me tell you something. Perception is always greater than reality. Wait a minute. Let me help you with this. I guess you're confused. 
I listened to a very powerful, wonderful uh, young black preacher man, pastored a great church, and he would say things to his church, and when they didn't say anything, he would say, you know, you missed a good opportunity to get in on this. So he said, I'll tell you what. So apparently you can't hear my voice, and I say something real good, and I know it's better than you think it is. He said, I'll just point to the front of the pulpit, and when I point to the front of the pulpit, that's your cue to say amen. Now, I know you're laughing, but I do that all the time to our church family back home. I throw something out that I'm even impressed with. <laughs> and they don't say nothing. I go, oh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you got to hear When I just said perception is greater than reality, it's more powerful than reality. And here's why. God gave the nation of Israel the promised land. And their perception stole it from them. They said there won't be any man, there won't be any army, there won't be any nation that can stand against you. I've given you the title deed, the land is yours. But their perception said, uh, we can't take it because we see the giants and we see the walled cities and we see their armies. Just what the reverend said tonight. You get to study in the problem and you get blind to the potentate. If God is for me, it doesn't matter who or what is against me. Let me try it again. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Woo! Now just... Just bear with me just for a minute because I, I really need to say this. God wants to change your reality. If you're sick, he wants to make you whole. If you're discouraged, he wants to make you encouraged and strengthened. If you're lost, he wants to make you saved. If you're confused, he wants to make the things plain for you. He wants to change your reality, but your reality is not tied just to facts. Your reality is tied to your perception. How you see it. It's how you're going to believe it. And how you believe it is going to determine your destiny. If you see that God wants to bless... I don't want to hurt you folks, okay? I'm just a visitor. If you people think that sickness makes you more godly and makes you a better praiser, how come our ICU wards and our emergency rooms aren't cathedrals of praise? And if you believe that it's God's will for you to be sick and eat up with a bunch of diseases, then Jesus came to the planet and he fought against his own father's will because he said, I'm healing everything I can find. And I'm delivering everybody that I can deliver. And then he turned around and said, I only do the things which I see my father do and I only say what my father said to me and then 14 times in four gospels he said he healed them he healed them all he healed all them that had need of healing if healing is not heaven's will then Jesus was violating his own father's mandate Now, I understand that there is a mystery in the sovereignty of God. Why we pray for some people that don't get healed. I have no idea why they don't get healed. I have no idea, but I'm expecting them to get healed. Because my perception is that when Jesus got beat half to death at Pilate's whipping post, we were healed by his stripes. And his brutalization was a license for me to say, I believe you're a healer, Lord. Put your hand on my head and let, and let the Holy Ghost do something in my body. Woo! Now, I'm, I'm not trying to work anybody up into a fever. You're so far beyond a fever, I can't even reach you. But I'm here to tell you something. We're being deceived by a lying devil that wants us to accept things that we don't have to accept. 
I've had friends in the Pentecostal movement. I've had loved ones that we've prayed and fasted and sought God and they died. I have no idea. All I know is God is God. Don't have to give no answers. We had a lady in our church had muscular dystrophy. She just limped a little, then shook a little, then finally she got crippled. She was on a walker, and then she was finally in a wheelchair, and then she finally laid down. And one day her own daughter came back and put her hands on her feet, told that devil to get out of her body. Something slammed the door clear open. She stood up, and she was healed for two years. I'm not trying to cause no trouble. I'm just telling you a story. It happened to me. Two years. She was our deaf ministry coordinator. But, uh, do you have deaf ministry here? No? Thank you. <laughs> we have deaf ministry. And the only reason we have deaf ministry is because we don't believe in healing. <laughs> now, I've traveled all over the United Pentecostal Church. And I've been beat up by the best politicians, and that's not you. I mean, beat up by the best politicians. And when I was preaching in the Ohio camp meeting, they had all these deaf people here, and they're doing all this sign language and, and all this kind of stuff. And I said, I appreciate you trying to communicate with these people, but that is not a Jesus ministry. Because when Jesus walked into cities and people were deaf, he did not turn to his apostles and say, now here's how you deal with the deaf. He said, no, no, here's how you deal with the devil. And he spoke to them. And he put his fingers in them. And he said, Ephratha, be thou open. Pow! Those ears popped open. You've got to get your perception beyond reality. You've got to see that he's never changed. He's still everything he was before, and he wants you well. Stay, stay, just stay with me. Stay, just stay with me just a minute. I'll just, I'll just be just a few minutes. If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, take this one back where you are, good preacher man. Listen to this one. Per Ready? Perception's the key. Faith and fear always operate from your perception. Let me try another one. Expectation is always the birthplace for the miraculous. You ain't going to get nothing if you don't expect it. You got to reach. You got to cry out. You got to somehow be persuaded. God wants to bless me. God wants to help me. God wants to save me. God wants to deliver me. God is on my side. Sit down, sit down. I gotta go quick. I gotta go. Now watch. The lady that the Lord healed walked around for two years. One day she came in a service, Bishop, just like this. I said, "What in the world's going on?" She says, "I don't know." A week later, she's walking on a cane. Two weeks later, she's walking on a walker. Finally, put her in a wheelchair. Then they put her in a laying down wheelchair that she had to move with her mouth. And I'm fasting and I'm praying and I'm asking God, what in the world is going on? And they put her into hospice. And we prayed till our tongues fell out. We said, God, you're a healer. Come on, do something. Fix this thing. And, and poor little sister Nancy looked up at me that last day and said, Brother Arnold, she's all twisted. She said, please get Jesus to heal me. I know he's a healer. Man, I laid hands and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened. I walked outside and she was dead. Every devil that could have belched out of hell got in my face and said, what are you going to do about that stupid healing stuff now? How are you going to teach it now? She just died. I said, well, I know what I'm going to do. And he said, what you going to do? I came up in the front of the platform. I said, next. I'm not 
not going to let something that didn't work shut me down. I'm not going to let something that hurt my heart shut me down. I need someone to tell me he's a healer. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a baptizer with the Holy Ghost. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Somebody shout at me. Next. Next. Woo! Sit down. Sit down. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story, Bishop. Man, I got so inspired. I got ready to preach that girl's funeral. The Lord gave me a message about Dorcas. I said, my God, we're fixing to have a resurrection here. I'll wait any second. Just go ahead, Lord. Pinch me. Go ahead. Just put you. Just stick me in the head. Pull my hair. Go ahead. Just say, now. And I'll rip that crazy coffin off, and I'll slap her out of that thing. Well, the, the, the Lord never said anything. And so I buried her, and I put her in the ground. I went home. I was devastated. All the nincompoops that are in our assembly, they're damning me and condemning me and railing on me and making fun of me. Every devil that could belch out of hell is saying, well, it didn't work, it didn't work. So I just got in one of my question and answer sessions with the Lord. And I said, all right, let's, let's lay the cards out here on the table. What, 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 what happened here? How, how come you didn't raise her up? How come you didn't heal her? I'm, I'm looking bad right now. He said, oh, is this about your image? Sometimes you got to look bad to look good. Some, sometimes you got to fail to experience a fresh victory. Sometimes you got to go down to get back up. This ain't about our image. This is about his image. Sit down. Sit down. I got a word for you. I got a word for you. Just stay with me. I got a word for you. So the Lord began to talk to me. You got to be careful when you challenge God. He's prone to talk. You know what's funny? They, they asked hundreds of questions in the book of Job. Almost 300. Do you know that when the Lord answered Job, he answered 301. God can ask you a question you can't answer. That's what he said to that woman that was shacking up in Samaria. Go call your husband. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of you folks that are hot shots and big deals and money people, God can put his finger on you one day in his service. And say, I want to ask you about what you've been watching. I, I want to talk to you about what you've been saying. And you get your finger up in the air and say, excuse me. <laughs> so when I began to ask the Lord, how come the Lord let this precious lady die? And I even gave him a choice. I said, why don't you take some of the stupid people? Why don't you take some of the church splitters I always have to deal with? Why don't you take some of those whoremongers that are playing church that go here once in a while? What, what, well, I just, why don't you take some of the fags and the queers and the Twinkies? Get them out of here. Don't, 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 be, don't be taking no, no good people out. I need good people. And the Lord just dealt with me and said, oh, you got a problem. You don't understand. I said, oh, I just laid on me. He said, she was mine. He said, she was baptized in my name and she had the Holy Ghost. And she lived for me all these years and I decided to take her home. What's that to you? Never mind the next time it didn't work. Never mind the next time you look bad. There'll be a time coming after that when you will pray for somebody and they will get healed and they will get the Holy Ghost. Don't let that lying devil hold you hostage because something didn't work out. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I'm almost finished with my introduction. Just stay with me. I feel in my heart I need to tell you this. Somebody needs uh, struggling with something, you need to hear me. And the Lord began to deal with me. And he said, don't you know, son, 
that my church fasted and prayed and wept and wailed for two of their great leaders. James was put in jail and Simon Peter was put in jail and I loved them both equally. I did not love one more than the other. I'm not a respecter of persons. And he said, so I heard both their prayers and I sent a sword to take James's head off. And I sent an angel to get Peter out of prison. What's that to you? And here's what he told me. He told it to me. I didn't steal it. He told it to me. And you and the rest of my people are going to have to learn how to live with and deal with unfulfilled expectations. That's what those two guys on the road to Emmaus said. When Jesus joined them, he said, we had hoped. That word literally means we had expected. Yeah, but he got himself bumped off and they hung him on like a piece of meat on a tree and threw him in a hole. And now some crazy ladies, you know how them dumb ladies are. Them ladies, they're all imbalanced and wacko and emotional. They come back and said they've been talking to angels. They've seen an empty grave. You know, those crazy women. And, and they're talking to a resurrected Jesus and they're fussing about some irrational women. And I see what Jesus says. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all the things that are spoken of for me in the prophet, the Psalms. Watch what he said. Should not Christ also have suffered these things? Now watch. That he might enter into his glory. Could there be that God in his divine sovereignty and wisdom and knowledge decides to send some things into our lives that's the only way we can step into the next level of glory. That's, that's the only way we can experience something that God wants us to experience. So sometimes in your life, you've got to look at trouble and say, welcome, friend. that trouble but the Lord says yeah but you need it why do I need it because I'm taking you to another dimension I'm going to let your trouble be your teacher uh, let, me, let, let me just get to my sermon I'm not helping you at all you see Satan uses perception he shows you what is and he lets you feel what is so he can steal from you what can be. Well, you ain't got enough money to do that. Yeah, but my dad does. Well, you ain't got nobody that's your friend at the bank. I know somebody who owns the bank. I know somebody that can make a way where there is no way. I know somebody who can open the Red Sea. I know somebody who can roll back a Jordan. I know somebody that can talk to dead people and they get up. Hey, just stay with me. Stay with me just for a minute. Stay with me for just for a minute. You see, here's the power of a problem. And you mentioned all about problems. Here's the power of a problem. It has the ability to paralyze your faith or provoke your faith. When we end up in a problem or a nasty mess or a disaster or a crisis or whatever it is, the adversary is going to do everything he can to make your disaster become your dungeon. But your ally is going to use your disaster to bring you deliverance. Because your problem has got the ability to do one of two things. It can either become your prison house or your pathway to an answer. You say, well, I don't like being sick. Well, I don't like being hurt. Well, I don't like being disappointed. Good. Now take your problem and let it become a platform for you to go after the potentate. 
Don't suck your thumb over your problem. Don't suck your thumb because something's going bad in your life. Say, God gave me this bad. Why? David said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Why? Because your affliction provoked me to come to know you better than I've known you and know myself better than I know myself. Now, I appreciate the, the 25 people that are clapping and standing up. I'd like to go after all you super glued suck right now. All you super glued folks. You don't know what a debt you owe to God for your disaster, for your problem, for your pain. I wish I, I, wish I was back in my black church right now. I'd like to, I'd like to, here's what those black folks say. I wish I could get a witness. messed up. I know it was. But my mess is what caused me to move towards the miracle worker. I was a drunk and I didn't know how to get sober. But I knew somebody who could get you sober. I was sick and I didn't know how to get fixed. But I heard about a healer. So I let my pro I let my problem push me into my answer. Don't let your problem paralyze you. Let your problem push. Sit, sit down just a second. Sit down just a second. My God. You, you see, here's your deal. I, I can't see. I'm in a police line up here. I can't see. Listen to me. You gotta make a decision. I'll be here a few more minutes. I'll be here 15 minutes, not five. I'll be here 15 minutes. You gotta make a decision. Are you gonna let your problem keep defining you? You say, well, what does that mean? That ain't no Bible. Uh, you need to turn off your TV. I know the Bible. Don't tell me your problem can't define you. How about the man with the withered hand? What's his name? Oh, that's right. He's not nameless. His problem names him. The man with the withered hand. The lady in Luke 13 who's been over. Blind Bartimaeus. Simon the leper. Zacchaeus. Don't get offended. The tree climbing politician. <laughs> the lady with the issue of blood the demonized boy mark 9 what's his name oh no we only know him by what's wrong with him and we define him I refuse to let the devil, the world, or sickness or disease or mistakes define me. I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me and gave himself for me. I may fail, but I am not a failure. I may fall down, but I'm fixing to get back up. All right, before you're seated, before you're seated, I want everybody as loud as you can say, and we let finish. Thank you, Jesus, for my problems, my crisis, my mess, my issues. They're going to push me towards my answer. They're going to move me towards my deliverance. I'm going to use that to get to you. Rejoice not against me, O oh mine enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise, and when I sit in the darkness, the Lord shall be my light. You, you, 
you to sit down. I'm trying to finish. I'm not going anywhere, but I'm trying to finish. The bishop said something a little while ago, and I thought he was going to steal my thunder. And, I, and I'm limited in thunder. Listen to me. I'm going to make a few statements. You won't get this in Bible school. Don't waste your time going. I challenged some of our Bible school presidents the other day after I preached the general conference. They were so mad at me they couldn't see straight. I said, I want to know something. You guys running that Bible school. How come you teach homiletics, hookaletics, mockaletics, thisaletics, whataletics? You couldn't cast the devil out of somebody if you had a bad day. I want to know how come you wackos that are teaching Bible school, teaching everybody how to preach and how to teach, why don't you teach them how to heal people? Come on, let's start a class and let's learn how to do it. You learn by doing. You learn by trying. That's why the Bible says, they who by reason of use have their senses exercised thereby. What does that mean? The more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you do it, the stronger your faith is. The more people you pray for to get the Holy Ghost, more people get the Holy Ghost. You get better at it. The more you pray, the better you get. The more you praise, the better you get. The more you sacrifice, the better you get. The more you sing, the better you get. Sit down just a second. I just want to give you a couple of things, and I'm down in my last 10 minutes. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Only intolerance of your present situation will give birth to a new one. I'm going to go a little further. We Pentecostals, we Apostolics, I don't know what you call yourself, Mexi Mexi Mexicalic, Saxon, whatever, whatever you are. Happy jumping beans. Good, fine, happy. Fine. Whatever you sweet Spanish people are. Listen to me. We've come to the time. The bishop said it better than anybody ever heard. We've come to the time. We must stop complaining about stuff we tolerate. God ain't going to work for you when you keep putting up with stuff. Sometimes you got to turn around and get mad, dog mad. Barn York dog man says, that's it, I've had enough. I ain't putting up with this no more. I'm going for the Lord. I'm reaching for the throne. I'm stretching my hand out and I'm believing God to do something for me. Stop tolerating it. Declare war on it. Let go sit down. I'm, I'm running out of time. Here's another one I want to give you. You won't get this in Bible school. You ain't never going to possess what you're unwilling to pursue. We Pentecostals blow off about all the stuff we believe. You know, Abbott told Costello one time, he said, hey, what makes those big balloons fly up in the air? And he said, hot air. He said, what's keeping you down? Now, I know that's humorous, but I'd like to say that sometimes to Pentecostals. You blow off and you blow off and you say this and you say this and you shout till your socks fall down and your hair falls down and everything else falls down. But you're not getting anybody healed. You're not getting anybody saved. You're not getting anybody delivered. Why don't you stop the baloney and start getting real serious about this and start laying hands on people and start casting devils out of people and taking authority over people's diseases and sickness and command them to let them go. I don't mean to cause no trouble. Just, boy, you don't want to do that, baby. I'll get to... L listen carefully. Bible said, Jesus, let's go over. Jesus said, let's go over to the other side. So they're on their way to the other side. Is the directions understandable? Let's go over to the other side. The devil shows up in a storm and said, let's go under to the other side. But the original statement was, no, let's go over to the other side. Isn't it a bummer when you do what God told you to do and all hell breaks loose? 
was six of you. Ain't it a bummer when you're trying to do everything that you know God wants you to do, and you're trying to keep your morals clean, and trying to keep your mind clean, and trying to do it, and all of a sudden chaos and disaster and crisis just shows up, and you're doing the will of God. Remember, Samson was in the process of doing the will of God when the young lion roared out against him. You may meet some lions on your way to do the will of God, but when the Spirit of God comes on you, like Samson of old, you can tear that thing apart. <laughs> Trouble and problems and chaos and crisis is not an indicator that you've missed God. It probably means you are in the will of God. Stay, stay with me just for a second. I'm, I'm trying to get where I need to be here. Now, Jesus is asleep. This is the funniest thing I've ever read in the Bible. Now, I'm not trying to be disrespectful or irreverent to the Lord. But sometimes things that God does is funny. Now, you don't think so? You take a look at an aardvark. 43 tons of flesh and he eats termites. Has he got a sense of humor? <laughs> now watch. They're on their way over. Wind blows up. Sea goes crazy. Fills the whole boat. Jesus. Catching 40 Z's. <laughs> Doesn't it tick you off when God seems to sleep when you got all kinds of junk going on? <laughs> How can God incarnate sleep when I'm in trouble? Because he ain't. <laughs> Let me help you, baby. I'm on my way out of the promised land of Union City. But delay is not denial. Elijah went seven times trying to see if there was any rain coming. Remember the story? We've all preached it or have we? Seven times. There is nothing. That's that damnable spirit in this last day that's trying to tell you. Every time you pray and you reach and you stretch and you try, there's a spirit that comes back and says, there is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing to that holiness. There's nothing to that separation. There's nothing to that righteous living. There's nothing to the gifts of the Spirit. There's nothing talking and talking. They keep saying nothing, 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 till the last time. But the last time, the servant went back again. He said, what do you see? He said, I see the cloud the side of a man's hand. And when I looked at that, I said, now, why did he see a cloud the size of a man's hand? And the Lord took me to Nahum chapter 1, verse 3, and it blew my socks off. And it says these words, for the clouds are the dust of his feet. When he saw that cloud, he said, he's on the way. All you got is a little hand. That's okay. The master's on the way. The answer is on the way. I got five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Your answer will look small when it starts, but when it's finished, buddy, you'll have so much rain, you don't have to do with it all. <laughs> See, when we pray, we want a finished product. God is a God of seed. He don't give you the tree. He gives you the acorn. He doesn't give you the mustard tree. He gives you the mustard seed. That's why the Lord said, the kingdom is like unto a mustard seed. Why? Well, when it is sown is the least of all, but when it's grown, you got to get that in your spirit. Sown, grown, sown, grown, start, finish, start, finish. 
don't despise the day of little and small things. Because your answer... I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I don't want this being rated X. I don't want this being rated R. But I'm going to get real plain. You don't think God's got a sense of humor. He goes to a guy who's 99 years old and to a lady who's 90. They're both on walkers. <laughs> One's probably got Parkinson's disease. because You can get Parkinson's disease real easily if you're always saying no, no, no. And the Lord comes up to a guy who's 99 pushing 100. You're a kid compared to him. And he says, hey, I'm going to give you a little bubble, a little bambino with the wrinkle chick inside. <laughs> and I can see Abraham and Sarah saying, impossible, the factory shut down. He said, I can reopen the factory, baby. I can give you children when you've never had children. I can, I can heal what's been shut up. I can open up. I can make the barren a mother of a multitude. I can give you a miracle when the doctor says you can't have a miracle. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. Can you just see, you can sit down, you can see Abraham, keep going, rule and cool. You're doing all right, baby. I'm telling you what. I have to get you an asbestos fingers. Can you imagine when the Lord told Abraham that he was going to have a bambino from... And she comes out of the tent. And Abraham is going... Zippity doo die. My oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine coming my way. Zippity doo da, zippity a. How you doing, baby? Now you're all laughing, but most of us have been married. We've had that same kind of thing with you gals. The old man comes home and he gives you that look. I know, I'm married to the chick 46 years, I know. I just come in some kind of, what you say, Foxy? <laughs> Laugh all you want to, but I've had a lot of them in my life. What's your problem? <laughs> well, I'm flying home tomorrow, it's gonna take 12 hours. When I, when I meet the redhead bombshell, we ain't shaking hands. You shake hands when you go to an Amway meeting. I'm not going to an Amway meeting. She looks good. She kisses good. She hugs good. And the rest of it ain't none of your business. I know it's kind of humorous, but it is in the book. She's already been through the change of life, according to the Bible. It says she ceased to be with them as the man of a woman. They're, they're not, they're just, they go to bed every night, they're just shaking hands. My mom and dad used to say, you know, Jeffrey, your mother and I have been married so long, every night we go to bed and we shake hands. I said, really, Mom? He said, yeah, we let go, we kill each other. I, I don't want this to be get sexual and sensual, but you got to bear with me just for a few minutes. Can you see Abe? He's almost 100. You don't know what I know. And you might as well cooperate because it's a God thing. And she had a miracle baby. 
I prayed for lots of people all over the Pentecostal movement that have wanted to have children and couldn't have them. I've had them call me all over the place. They had babies. They had babies. I've had some people say, don't lay your hand on me. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not a miracle worker, but I'm here to tell you, I am so persuaded, I am so convinced that he is a good God. And he is a prayer answering God. And he can reverse the curse. He can open ears. He can open eyes. He can unstop mouths. He can encourage when you're discouraged. He can, he can lift up when you're depressed. He is the master of the universe. He's the Lord of glory. He's the great I am. Five minutes, five minutes. Now just bear with me just for a second. Just bear with me just for a second. I'm old, I'm old. Give me, listen. The Bible says the winds blow and they're probably puking their guts up, scared half to death. Now this has been funny to me all the time. It said they run over and wake him. Okay? Now it wasn't until a few years ago the Lord dealt with me and said, you know, you're, you're really accusing those guys wrongly. What did they think I could do? I'm a carpenter. Now, I know the Lord said, where is your faith? Why are you so fearful? How come you have no faith? Wait a minute. They had no faith that they could control the storm. But they had faith in who to go to. And, and they wake him. That's what the book says. And they wake him. I've never heard a sermon on this in my whole life. I wish I had time. I got an hour and a half that would knock your socks off. It's the one I was going to preach it because of the times this year, but I got shouted down. And they turned around and they said a very strange thing to him. Master. That's enough. See, a bunch of wussies. No, they said, Master. Let me try it again. When's the last time in all your hell and trouble, mess and crisis and devastation you ever said, Master! The master of disease. The master of disaster. The master of your finance. The master of your children. The master of your marriage. The, the master of your body. The master of your thoughts. He is the master. Wow. Your perception right now, you've got to see him as the master of your diabetes. He's the master of your arthritis. He's the master of the pain in your back. He's the master of a pinched nerve. If you can say, master. I'm, a, I'm almost done. You can sit down. I'm almost done. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now, please forgive me. I, I need therapy. I know I need therapy. I'm a wacko. I read things in the Bible that are so strange. They say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He's sound asleep. They wake him up. Isn't it funny how human fear can do to God what nature can't do? Because fear and faith both come from persuasion and perception. Watch. They wake him up. Brother, pastor, bishop, whatever else you is. They wake him up. Ready? They're in trouble. They're in a crisis. They're in a disaster. They think they're going to drown. Now, he's already said, we're going over to the other side. Let me help you again. You're not getting it. Let me tell you something they'll never tell you in Bible school. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. 
The promises of God are simply divine revelations of intention. And he gives us these promises showing what he intends to do. Then he steps back and says, okay, now what you're going to do? Because Israel was pregnant with promises for 40 years and they died outside the promised land waving the promise. See, you can be pregnant with promises, but if you don't act on the promises, they don't fulfill themselves. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But you got to pursue the Holy Ghost. And you lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. Well, you got to pursue getting prayed for. It's not going to work without your cooperation. All right, I'm trying to close. It's been a long night. Thank you. It's been a long night. You ready? See if you can get this one. And they wake up. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Watch him. Watch him. As he burst to the front of the boat. God don't ever get in a hurry. He don't need to. Watch this. This is the funniest thing I've ever read in the Bible. And he looks out at the winds and the waves, and here's what he said. Cut it out. I know what the Bible says. The King James says, But it says, spoke to the wind, spoke to the waves. I got it right here. It's in the Bible. I got it right here. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Let me ask you something as we close this, this meeting. How long has it been since you tried to talk to something that you can't see? Talk to that spirit that's trying to make your daughter immoral. Talk to that spirit that's trying to put your boy on drugs. Talk to that spirit that's trying to bring a divorce into your family or a disaster to your job. Sometimes you got to speak to stuff that don't look like it's listening. I'm in the Bible. The Lord told Ezekiel, talk to the dead bones. Ain't no bones listening. Ain't nothing happening. You don't think the neighbors thought that guy was out of his mind with his hair flashing in the breeze and he's standing at the top of that graveyard. Hey, hear the word of the Lord, you old dry bones. And I can see all the neighbors going, my God, the holy roller preacher's at it again. He's talking to dead things. He's preaching to a cemetery. Well, if you pass along long enough, you'll preach to cemeteries every once in a while. But they can come alive because he kept preaching. He said, hear the word of the Lord, oh, you dry bones. And the bones started coming together. Now, here's the test, Brother Dross. Here's the big one. See, he could preach to what he could see, and he got a little improvement. But there was still no life in him. Now the Lord gave him a test for his faith. Okay, now talk to what you can't see. Prophesy to the wind. Hear the word of the Lord, ye wind. Bring breath into these bones and make them live. And if you've got the Holy Ghost inside of you, you can speak to things that are dead and they have to come alive. You can... You can speak to things that are not working and they're going to start working. Remain standing. I'm, I'm closing. I didn't get to my sermon. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't get to those lepers. 
They use the famine and their plight and their starvation as a platform to bust a move. He said, we can just sit here like a bunch of fools and die. We go in the city, and them jerks are all eating each other. They're eating each other's kids. They're a bunch of cannibals. We'll die in there. So we'll, we'll, let's bust a move, man. Let's, let's try something. Do you, do you understand, brethren and sisterin? Do you understand? That that was a monumental, monumental act of faith for this reason. They were the only four guys that did not hear the prophetic promise of the prophet. The prophet said inside, about this time tomorrow, two measures of this, one measure of fine flour for this. They had no promise. They only had trouble. They had no divine declaration. They just had disaster and crisis and problems. But they used that crisis and their problems to motivate them and move them to try. How dare us, we who have so many promises and so many prophetic utterances and so many statements from the Almighty. May I say this to you in closing? You people that are sick, you people that have issues in your life, you people that are struggling or hurting or high blood pressure or whatever you got, let me give you a scripture to help you. In Colossians 1.16, Bishop, it says this statement. Talking about Jesus. He being ahead of everything, okay, but he says this. And he was before all things. What, 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 what did you say, Paul? I said he was before all things. You mean he was before sin? Yeah. He's before Satan? Yeah. He was before fallen angels? Yeah. Was he before diabetes? Yeah. Before cancer? Yeah. Before deafness? Yeah. Before crippling arthritis? Yeah. Before, you mean the one who existed before you had that can't fix what you got? I'm sorry I took so long. Finish. I'll finish. I didn't. I didn't get to what I wanted to say. Finish. Just finish. Okay. I'm. I'm. I'm tuckered out. Finish. Okay. Master, carest thou not that we perish? I said. He said, cut it out. Well, in in actuality, he didn't say peace be still either. It's a good translation. It translates what he said, but that's not what he said in the Greek or the Aramaic. That's not what he said. The literal translation is this. And Jesus stood in the bow of the boat and said, Be thou muzzled. And when I read that, I said, Be thou muzzled. He's talking to the wind and the water. Be thou muzzled. He said, Yeah. And the word muzzled, be thou muzzled, means a superior talking to an inferior. The creator talking to the creation. It's like you and I when we go in the backyard, that stupid dog that we own that we're going to keep getting rid of. And you just go out there, hey, shut up. And that dog just goes, um. watch. When the wind and the sea heard that voice, they said to each other, that's him. That's the boss. That's the master. That's the, that's the creator. That's the Lord. And you got him inside of you. If you've got the Holy Ghost right now, start talking to that thing that you want to get rid of. Speak to the mountain. Speak to the fig tree. Speak to that disease. Speak to that tormenting spirit. Talk to it right now. Lay hands 
hands on each other. Ask God to help them. Ask God to bless them. Ask God to heal them. Ask God to come to their rescue. Go ahead. Say, I bless you in the name of the Lord. May the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow be upon you right now. I bless you with health. I bless you with deliverance. I bless you with strength. I bless you with mercy. I bless you. But then he does not stop. Psalm 19 verse 1, Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. He does not stop with what's in the earth. He moves to the heavens. And one of the greatest symbols he's given us in the heavens is the sun. The S-U-N explains the S-O-N. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. What is the sun? It's a ball of fire. Now watch this. Where I come from originally, Martha's Vineyard, they have beautiful beaches. And so they have what they call sun worshipers. These are people that go to the beach and lay out before the sun. See, to be a worshiper, even the world understands it. They call them sun worshipers, and this is the requirement. You must go out from protection and expose yourself to the sun to worship. Then you must expose yourself and lay down before the sun until the sun changes you. You don't have to tell somebody, you don't have to ask somebody if you've been in the sun. The same token you can tell somebody when they've had a lot of sun, you can tell them, you can, especially in the winter months, you don't have to wonder if they stayed here in Wisconsin. Where'd you go? Because the sun has transformed their image, literally their looks. It transformed. And that's why when you're a true sun worshiper, you will come out from the protective covering of the world that shields you from the love of God. You will begin to peel off your armor and expose yourself to God. You will lay down before God until God changes you. And a true sun worshiper doesn't just lay on his back. He flips over and lays on his stomach because he wants to change all the way around. 